Well, hello, everybody. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, extending the invitation to speak at the um, 2021 CMT uh, Patient Family Conference. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. My name is Sui Ash Prasad. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and the Head of R&D at Tasha Gene Therapies. Um, before I start, I have a, a legal disclaimer slide, which I'll just put up on the screen for you to have a look at. Just making the point that um, uh, we're in the process of sharing data that is uh, being produced on an ongoing basis. So some of the information we'll present is preliminary as opposed to absolute. So I will be um, spending time talking a bit about Tasha Gene Therapies, who we are, our gene therapy programs. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus uh, quite a bit of time on, on our investigational gene therapy program for giant axonal neuropathy, um, and then talk about our sponsored genetic testing program also. And then I'm going to touch on uh, an earlier phase program of ours, the investigational gene replacement therapy program for CMT type 4. Now, for my background, I'm a pediatric intensivist by training, and uh, so I'm very used to treating children with very severe, um, rare neurological uh, conditions. And um, I've worked in the uh, biotechnology industry for about 20 years across a number of programs, all focusing on rare and severe pediatric neurological and metabolic disease. And my current role, as I say, is the Chief Medical Officer and the Head of R&D at Tasha Gene Therapies. So our mission at Tasha Gene Therapies is to use uh, our experience and our expertise on AV gene therapy to bring some hope to those living with severe monogenic neurological disease, in particular for rare patient populations. And we do this by addressing the unique biology of every indication. And I hope you get a sense of that as we go through this presentation. So our foundational building blocks are um, several fold. So we, we do leverage a commercially proven gene therapy platform. So you may be aware of the gene therapy for a disease known as spinal muscular atrophy. That's now a commercialized product known as Zolgesma. And many of us at the company have a lot of experience with that particular product. And the serotype used, i.e. the viral vector capsule that is used in that product is AAV9. And we use AAV9 for every one of our programs. We have a significant collaborative partnership with the University of Texas Southwestern, uh, led by Burge Manassian, who is the division chair of pediatric neurology, and Stephen Gray, who is the uh, head of the viral vector core and a, an expert, one of the world's uh, renowned experts on gene therapy. And the vast majority of our programs um, come out of the discoveries that they make at UTSW. We have a very nice collaborative effort that helps move the programs forward into IND enabling animal studies and then into the clinical situation. And then we have significant uh, key leadership uh, expertise um, at Tasha. Many of us have had a lot of experience in rare and severe uh, gene therapy approaches. And um, we, we have a lot of, we feel we have a lot of strength, a lot of depth in the experiences we have there. We have three uh, broad categories. So we have a group of patients that fall under the diseases uh, defined as neurodegenerative diseases. I, these are diseases which have an ongoing progressive uh, decline. And pathologically, what's happening is that neurons and brain cells are being lost over time. So the intent here is really to treat urgently and quickly before the neuron loss has had a chance to take hold. Our second bucket of um, uh, diseases that we treat are the neurodevelopmental disorders. This is where there is some unusual um, functioning that's happening in the brain. So diseases such as Rett syndrome or Angelman syndrome, well, we actually think the reversibility of the disease is quite high. Uh, we also have a third franchise, which is looking at genetic epilepsies. So these are epilepsies of children in particular, where children present with seizures days after birth, and increasingly, the molecular underpinnings of these epilepsies are being described, i.e. we're getting a much bigger understanding about what's happening at a molecular level to cause this particular type of um, neurodevelopmental epileptic uh, uh, problem. 
which was not the case 20 years ago. We, our molecular biology techniques were not as good uh, to be able to uh, determine that um, 20 years ago. So as I say, we have a great partnership with UTSW. This is a very um, collaborative partnership. And in fact, um, it's led by Stephen Gray, who's a really phenomenal gene therapy scientist and a, a very um, collaborative individual, uh, very thoughtful scientist. And Burj Manassian is one of the world's experts in several neurodevelopmental diseases, such as, such as Rett syndrome. They lead the group, they lead a team of about 60 individuals across a whole host of different uh, functions. So they have preclinical scientists, they have clinicians, they have um, bioanalytical scientists that can help with the development of the actual product that's administered to children. And so they end up doing much of the earlier work, I, identifying targets and doing some of the early proof of concept uh, work in the animal models. We tend to get more involved when we've shown, when Burge and Steve have shown proof of concept in the animal model, and then we then take it through the additional animal work to take it through to where the regulators are okay with it then going to clinical testing. We also uh, handle the regulatory interaction, i.e. with the FDA or indeed other international agencies. We actually write the clinical trial protocols, run the clinical trials, and we make drug in our GMP, good manufacturing practice, facility at a commercial scale, but we work very well in partnership. And there's this seamless transition uh, from what they're doing in the early stages to what we're doing at a later stage. And we spend a lot of time and energy and effort really focusing on understanding the patient perspective. Central to our work is this idea that everything we're doing is, is really in the service of children and families affected by these rare and severe neurological diseases. Uh, we try and communicate well with you all, and we, um, you know, we have a, a very, um, a very robust uh, patient affairs, patient advocacy group at the company, led by Emily, um, who is uh, our uh, chief patient uh, advocacy officer at the company. Uh, and we spend a lot of time and energy talking with patients and families really to help understand how the experiences you're going through can inform how we develop the drug, specifically how we select endpoints in a clinical trial and how we can inform um, regulatory interaction and, and teach the FDA and others about the patient perspective, as well as the physician perspective, as well as the scientific perspective. It's a key key area that we really need to focus on. And I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the patient workshops we run and how some of those insights actually do blend in with uh, our regulatory strategy and our clinical development plans. So there's three foundational elements to our gene therapy approach. And it's one of the reasons why we can actually run a whole host of different programs. Uh, the first, as I've already mentioned, is that we use AAV9 viral vector capsids, so serotype AAV9 for every one of our programs. So we know how to make AAV9 very well. It has the most clinical and commercial experience. Uh, and we it's a very suitable vector because it penetrates the uh, brain and spinal cord cells very nicely. That's the first foundational aspect to our approach. The second is the manufacturing process we use. It's something that's called HEK293 suspension. Uh, and it's, I won't go into what the numbers or the letters mean, but basically it's a mammalian cell approach to growing and developing gene therapy products that is well established and well understood. We know how to make drug that way. We know how to scale up to making larger amounts of drug, and we know how to characterize that type of product very, very well. And once again, we use this same process for every one of our programs. And then the third piece is that we give the drug intrathecally, i.e., we pop a needle into the base of the spine, the lower back, so L3, L4, or L4, L5, slide the needle in while the patient's on their side, um, take the needle out, allow some cerebrospinal fluid to drip out, and then slowly inject about 10 or 12 mils of drug into the intrathecal space. We then remove the needle, put a, a Band-Aid on, turn the patient on their back, head tilted down uh, by about 15 to 30 degrees just to ensure good mixing and allow the drug to then penetrate the brain and the spinal cord. And once again, there's a lot 
of great clinical data now showing that an intrathecal route of administration is a very appropriate one, especially for a disease that affects the brain and the spinal cord. So that's a brief overview of Tasha. I'm now going to talk about uh, the data from our lead program, um, which is uh, giant axonal uh, neuropathy. And this is a uh, disease that is, is often um, found in shark marrow tooth clinics in the, in the adults. Um, and it, it starts off, uh, the underlying uh, pathological issue is that there is a mutation in the gene that codes for a protein called gigaxanin. Gigaxanin is part of the UPS or the ubiquitin proteasome system. And what that does is it removes old denatured waste structural proteins from the axons and the nerves. So in the absence of the protein gigaxanin, you get a buildup and accumulation of these old degraded structural proteins that should be taken away but they're not taken away. And instead you get an accumulation. So you get a swelling of the axon and then some, some uh, tissue gen degeneration and inflammation. And what this does is it affects the uh, ability to send electrochemical signals down the actual neuron. And that ultimately results in the clinical phenotype of giant axonal neuropathy. So the first symptom is usually uh, presents around the age of two or two and a half and three, three years of age. And this is where the children start walking with a wide based gait and they take very high arch steps and they become unsteady. And this is because they uh, lose their sensation to the soles of their feet. So they can't feel the feet can't feel the floor beneath their feet. So they start to become a bit unsteady. As time progresses, the, um, the sensory abnormality becomes more of a, um, a motor abnormality as well. And um, children start to lose motor function and they become weak and usually end up in a wheelchair around the age of 10. Um, sadly on the ventilator by the age of 15 and um, they usually progress towards death in the late teens or the early 20s. So a very sad, relentlessly progressive uh, condition. Now we've developed a gene therapy um, that helps replace the protein that's missing, the gigaxanin. So you can see on the right hand side of this particular slide, this is what the construct looks like. So the blue bit, the light blue bit is the um, full length human gigaxanin gene. So this is the DNA that codes for gigaxanin. Next to that, you've got what we call a jet promoter. That's in the dark blue. What this promoter does is encourage expression of the gene uh, and the protein therefore in relevant tissues. And it's wrapped up in the self complementary AV9 capsid. Okay. This uh, gene therapy drug was first administered to patients in 2015 in a uh, study that was being conducted at the National Institutes of Health under the leadership of Carson Bonneman, who's a world renowned um, clinical expert in neurological diseases of children. This is the how we approach the study. I've already talked about how we administer drug intrathecally. You can see some diagrams on the right hand side of the slide that, that discusses that. Uh, and you can see that on the left hand side of the slide, um, we have four dose groups. So a low dose, a medium low dose, a medium high dose, and a higher dose. Now, I need to emphasize that the study is still ongoing currently. And I would share some data from uh, some of the earlier doses uh, and you'll get a sense of how the, the drug is performing. But we, it's only preliminary data. We don't have the full, the full story yet. But certainly what we're seeing thus far is, is very encouraging. Now, the key endpoint in the study is known as the MFM32. This is the motor function measure 32. And it's a very well-known, well-established um, uh, a rating scale that clinicians use to rate the level of motor capability of a patient. 
and uh, there are 32 questions. Each question is scored between um, um, three and zero and um, send converted to a percentage. And what we know from a lot of studies that have been done is that is a four point decline in the MFM 32 is deemed to be a clinically meaningful change. So a four point decline is a clinically meaningful change or a four point improvement would be a clinically meaningful improvement. And what you can see in the graph in the bottom left hand side of this slide is these are patients and you see on the y-axis, you've got the MFM32 score. On the x-axis, you've got the age of the patient. So going from zero all the way up to about 16 or 17. And this is data that's been collected from the natural history study that is currently uh, underway at the NIH, uh, which is uh, the precursor study to the interventional study, the drug study. And what we see here is that patients are declining by about eight points per year on the MFM scale. So this is a, a clinically meaningful decline, and it's a significant decline. And to add some context, um, a score of 100 is a normal, healthy child. A score of about 70, the child will be needing a, a, a walking aid, a walker, for example. By the time the score hits about 55 or so, the child will need a wheelchair. So you can see this, this ongoing progressive decline in the MFM 32 score. Now, what you see here on the right hand side is a graph that's looking at the medium low dose in the light blue color and the medium high dose in the green color. And whether you see the vertical dashed line, that's the point at which the child was treated with drug intrathecally. So before the dashed line, you can see this decline in the MFM32 scale. Okay, it's coming down. Once the child is treated, you can see there's a dramatic change in the trajectory of that line. So it almost, not quite, flattens out. So you're rapidly reducing, significantly reducing the rate of decline with the medium low and the medium high dose, which you can see in this particular slide on the right hand side. Okay, so this is really important data. We're showing a meaningful, clinically relevant decline in the rate of disease progression. And of course, don't forget if we treat a patient earlier in life, when their level of functioning is high, you'll be able to preserve that state of functioning very, very considerably. As I say, the study has been going on for quite a long time, since 2015. Uh, patients are continuing to be dosed. So uh, just to re-emphasize the point that this is preliminary data, we still have some way to go yet. Um, but we do have a number of patients with a handful of years of treatment. So we have some long-term data and we have some good data that suggests near, uh, near stabilization of disease progression. And we're looking at different doses of drug. So we actually also showed, showed dose response. The high dose data from this study are gonna be shared later on this year. And then we often get asked about safety and you know, are there any side effects of this uh, therapy? And, uh, you know, there are a lot of side effects of gene therapy that's currently being discussed in general. But uh, what I would say is that so far things have been quite tolerable. There's been no major gene therapy related safety concerns in any of the patients that have been treated thus far. Now, I'm going to show two or three slides worth of patient workshop data. So moving away from the clinical trial and giant axonal neuropathy, I want to share some data on the patient workshops that we've run. So what you can see here is we've actually gone through every question on the MFM32 and asked patients and families, is this a meaningful question for you? Does it actually accurately reflect how your child is feeling or functioning? And you can see here that um, certainly most of the questions on the MFM32, patients and their families say, yes, it is relevant. You know, you're asking relevant questions that are meaningful on the child's motor function, and they also impact our, um, our life at home. And um, as part of the assessment of, with the patient workshops, there's a, there's a quantitative aspect where we actually try and collect data and numbers, but there's also a qualitative piece to this. And you can see here, um, we've just collated some quotes from patients and families that relate to specific 
questions on the MFM32. So, for example, if you look at the the, the line, the, the column in the middle, question 30, you know, can you run 10 meters, which is one specific question on the MFM32. You can see some of the qualitative comments and quotes that patients and families are, are making. For example, not being able to run makes it harder for my child to play or exercise. Um, most people my age stay active. I could not tell you the last time I was physically able to run. I never enjoyed playing sports, but if I could do it again in the future, that would be a miracle. So let me just pause here for a moment and you can read some of the other quotes that we're hearing from patients and families. So moving on to the next slide, you can see some of the other areas outside the motor function we're looking at. So, so a lot of patients and families talk about uh, visual loss and uh, the fact these children lose their sight over time. And this is really devastating for families because the children are losing their ability to talk, to listen, to communicate. And the last way of communicating as a child's disease progression is, is non-verbally. And once the vision goes, it's a really uh, upsetting um, symptom of the disease. So if we can preserve sight in some way, that'll be wonderful. And um, and so we're looking at visual uh, function in the actual clinical study. And it does appear uh, from a preliminary perspective uh, that there is some stabilization of this loss of visual acuity that, uh, that GAN patients have. And you see some of the other areas that are being looked at. Gastrointestinal issues often come up as a, a real problem. Um, the ability to socialize well and function in a social environment, school, for example. Lots of concerns about choking on, on taking, taking in food. And so we're studying all these aspects of the disease in the clinical trial uh, by focusing on some specific endpoints that are relevant. So in terms of next steps for TASIA 120, which is the, the number we give to the GAN program, we're, um, we're continuing to work with the NIH where the patients have been uh, uh, have been assessed. Um, we're in the process of manufacturing commercial grade GMP material. So 14 patients have been dosed. There's enough drug to dose another few patients, but we'll need to make more drug to continue dosing. And then we're planning to speak to regulators uh, towards the end of this year and early next year, specifically the FDA in the US, the MHRA in the UK and the EMA in Europe. Uh, we're gonna share our data with these agencies and see what more they need. Uh, from a data perspective to map out a pathway to an approval, a regulatory approval where then this will be available to, um, to treat patients all over the world. That's the, that's the intent. So another program I'd like to talk about is uh, the uh, sponsored genetic testing. Um, and, and this is important as times progressed uh, our ability to detect mutations and what's happening at a molecular level, just as, as science has progressed, is, is increasingly advanced. And, um, you know, I think it's uh, important to, as you know, diagnose patients as early as possible in the course of their disease. And this is not an opportunity of being, being able to do that. So we actually announced quite recently a partnership with a group called GeneDX, where we are um, partnering with them and funding testing, mutation analysis testing for giant axonal neuropathy. So what this will mean, how this works in practice is that if a clinician feels they'd like to get their patient tested for um, giant axonal neuropathy, whether they're a new patient that's presented with uh, some of the features of GAN, or whether it's a patient already existing in their clinic, maybe with a diagnosis of a shark and marrow tooth type disease or some other hereditary sensory motor neuropathy. Um, if that clinician would like to get that patient tested, they can do so free of charge. So that the, the mutation analysis testing is gonna be covered uh, by ourselves. And this is uh, starting to be rolled out at centers of excellence towards the end of this year, and then will be more extensive across the US uh, over the course of next year. Uh, and we're not just testing for one gene, we're testing for several genes that cause GAN. 
the test has actually been around for quite some time, but but I think issues with insurance sometimes mean that patients don't get the test done or the, there's a lack of knowledge, but we'll be talking a lot and publicizing the test and, and hopefully uh, clinicians will start to send the test into GeneDx uh, when, um, if they suspect their patient has giant axonal neuropathy or may have giant axonal neuropathy. And of course, if you feel you'd like to have a test, please have a conversation with your, your uh, clinician and uh, they can contact GeneDx or ourselves and we can facilitate that mutation testing happily. So we're very excited about that program and hopefully this will lead to uh, patients that uh, can be identified with a GAN mutation who therefore may be amenable to the gene therapy approach once we've completed the clinical trial and really understood the pros and cons of this particular type of medicine. So the final thing I wanted to touch on was um, another program we've got much, much earlier in development. And there's not much to say about this, but to let you know that we're, we're moving it forward. Uh, and this is a program looking at Charcot-Marie tooth type 4A, which is, sub, is a subtype of CMT caused by mutations of the GDAP1 gene, which can affect myelin structure, um, and this can affect communication between neurons and indeed along neuronal tissue as well. Uh, we've actually been able to identify the GDAP1 gene. You can see the construct on the right hand side. Um, it's the full length uh, human DNA for the GDAP1 gene with a CBH promoter. The CBH promoter is the promoter that encourages expression in the cell type in which it's necessary. Uh, it is a fairly strong promoter and expresses in all cells and it's wrapped up in an AV9 self-complementary capsid. So the, uh, the early proof of concept work is ongoing. And this is the usual path forward for a gene therapy such as uh, GAN or for, for CMT4A. There's a discovery phase and a proof of principles phase where you design the vector construct design the gene therapy, you put it into a few animals who have the particular disease. If you see a proof of concept, it then moves to more formal preclinical research where you have to do specific pharmacology studies and toxicology studies in the animals um, that demonstrate safety and efficacy to the point where the regulators such as the FDA are agreeable to allowing us to dose patients. We then run the clinical trials and I shared data from our ongoing clinical trial in the giant axonal neuropathy program. Uh, and we would anticipate being able to start a study for the CMT4A program once the preclinical research has been done. And then once the studies have been done, we can then file the data with one of the regulators, with the FDA in the US, the EMA in Europe, uh, for a full approval, and then have the drug be able to be prescribed by clinicians where it can help patients all over the world. So thank you very much. I've spent time talking about Tasha as a program, as a, as a company. I've talked a bit about our giant axonal neuropathy program, which is in clinical development. I've touched on CMT for a program, which is in a much earlier phase of development. I've touched on our partnership with GeneDx and genetic testing as a whole. I'm looking forward to coming back uh, to uh, more meetings uh, and telling you more about what's happening and giving you additional updates. So I'd like to really thank the CMTA uh, for the invitation to speak and for our partnership and collaboration. Uh, in addition, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Hannah's Hope, who've done a tremendous amount of work on the GAN program and also our collaborative efforts with the Hereditary Neuropathy Foundation. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us and contact us if you have questions or concerns. And uh, I'll be sitting on the panel later on today uh, with some other uh, colleagues and um, and. Uh, highly uh, uh yeah highly regarded individuals to talk more about clinical trials so please feel free to come along and ask questions at that event thanks very much goodbye <laughs>